Bete won the what check a chicha cup, young ha Namichi on the ha. What check a killer Koskalaka with Koskalaka, Kantaha, Wokie, Unichilapi, young ha Woka near Naha, won't spare Henako with Chakopia. Beyond this page is my story, completely told by me. I'm not completely amazing or horrible entirely. I'm me. More importantly, I've been me. Oh uh, yeah, I grew up here though, my whole life, 16 years. Yeah, I've been living on a reservation all 18 years of my life. I like the nature and um, the people around you. We're all close together. Um, and it's, it's easier for me to grow up here because I have my family close to me. Because we're so family oriented, like we grew up, we're always, our family's always there. We're always doing things with our family. Well, I guess I'd like to say like my brothers, dude. You, they're not like my brothers, but you know, they're like my brothers, man. Like I have so many like in Pine Ridge, you know, all my skate brothers. I have brothers here, you know, you know, like, and it's like, it's good. It's like a brother, sh it's like a brotherhood, you know? And it's like, we're all together and we all do things we love together or we find common interests and we become, you know, like this, man. And it's, it's just good and it brings up your spirits. I, th I think that it's really cool that we have like, what I really love about living here is that, like, we have a, a story behind everything, and we have a history behind um, all of our land and our people and stuff. Uh, living down here, it's peaceful. It's a small town, and there's nothing much that really happens except for come school and it's mainly come school, see family. That's about it. I think what was fun growing up here was pretty much just living, you know, in the country and pretty much um, exploring the creeks and to the badlands and stuff. Me and my friends, were, uh, we horseback ride. Like we break horses, um, go on rides, horseback rides, really long ones. Yeah. Where we live is uh, really close to the badlands. We live like on the outskirts of it. And we live right next to Cedar Butte. So it's always um, soothing to to look at Cedar Butte and all the beautiful uh, twilight colors at um, sunset. Um, I like how it's a really small place so you can get to your friend's house faster or just like by walking. For fun, I hang out with my friends and I in after school activities like sports. Hmm. I like how empty it is. Like there's big long fields where you can just see to like the end like to where your eyes can't see anymore you just see blue and it's like it's great going to powwows playing hand games <laughs> and learning my traditional ways going to sun dances and inipis and learning the old traditional ways like the future like the the reservation because I I do want to raise my kids here on the reservation I don't a lot a lot of the times you see people moving their families away you know for better opportunities but this is what has shaped me and this is what has made me everything that I am today and I do want to raise my children here I do want to have a family and a home here but first there are a lot of changes that we have to make as you know, communities and as families and as people. The stigma around here is this constant feel of 
negativity around here? You know, I'm only 17, but I've seen so many things that really should not even be here. We were thrown onto reservations, or placed onto reservations, and it sort of stuck around. We, we sort of parted from our traditional ways, and some of us even forgot about them. And uh, it's kind of sad. Oh, boo-hoo, it happened to you guys. Big deal, that's all you guys talk about. It's like, because no one gets it, man. I mean, we teach about history so that way history doesn't repeat itself, right? Sitting Bull was just killed about two weeks before that. And my grandfathers had moved down from Standing Rock to a place called Bridger and Sherry Creek. And uh, Vicfoot was on his way down to help negotiate a uh, truce between the U.S. Cavalry and Red Cloud, the Ogallala. He was a peacemaker. Uh, he never reached Pine Ridge. He and his families and most of his people were wiped out at Wodanay. Uh, there were a few survivors. So, you know, the U.S. government's purpose in the beginning was kill the buffalo, kill their food supply, um, their culture. There was a retaliation for Custer being wiped out in 14 years before at Little Bighorn when uh, Custer and Ventine and Reno and all the major heavies of the Civil War came down, came here and started the wars against Indians and they were defeated. Our tribe was one of the last ones to be caught by the government so we're like a I wouldn't say really fierce, but we're like a strong tribe. In the evening, they camped at uh, Wonanee Creek, and the next morning, for no reason at all, the U.S. Cavalry just opened fire on the Indians. The women and children were mowed down. It was told by my, my Aunt A, my dad, that Washichu means um, takers of the slaves. Now there's other people who will say washi ichu means to take the fat. Now why to take the fat? The taking of the slaves kind of kind of obvious that one there, but to take the fat, that the reference is I think to the society to the race that will take everything you own and the fat that on the on your stake, you know, they'll take everything that you own and the fat on your on your dog. <laughs> Hitler got the idea to, to genocide the Jews and he took it from, he took a note from the best killers ever, the United States government. I mean, they're still bombing places, you know? They still, they got all this land, everything else, they still want more. They're reaching out for resources left and right. And I know some people will say that is derogatory and... I don't know. You know, I grew up here. That's what we called white people. Washichu. I don't. Not ashamed to say that. That's what I was taught. And, and like concentration camps, reservations, concentration camps. They killed us. Okay, but the Jews still don't live there. You know what I mean? I mean, we we got forced on this place because because we were different. Because we were savage. Because we, weren't, because we didn't speak English and we didn't do everything the way they wanted us to do it. So we got placed on these little chunks of land and were forced to, li forced to live there. Wanai Wa-chee-ki-a-poi Wa-nai-ai Wa-chee-ki-a-poi 
I learned in school that war is when nations disagree. But what the textbooks never told me is that war also happens when parents disagree or a child throws insults harder than they swing baseball bats or when I cannot force myself out of bed because there is a voice that tells me I may win the battle, but I will not win the war. They don't have, their parents don't watch them good enough. They don't show them enough attention. They just, they show them that they don't care. And once they feel like their parents don't care, they feel like no one cares about them. And they're just, they go down the wrong path, you know, joining gangs is the main thing probably around here. And, you know, they vandalize and break in houses and I don't know what all. And that's just, that's just all their parents fault, I believe. War takes place when nations disagree. War also can take place within people too. Like parents being around their kids more and being active with their kids and yeah, not leaving them so much. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know, I just wish that like the adults would understand that these kids need guidance, man. Like these kids need, you know, they can't be sit here and just, you know, they grow up by themselves. I mean, yeah, it's up to them to lead their own lives, but they can't do that when they're like, you know, seven, eight. You're like all they have to look up to. And if you're sitting there, you know, doing stupid shit, you know, being, acting like you're a fucking teenager whenever you have kids, like, come on, man, no kid's gonna sit there and look at you and that's all they're gonna see. So they're not gonna know to do good in school and go to, you know, college. Don't get me started on my father, or the man who just helped me be made, who never was around at all. Oh, how I wished he would stayed. He knew me but didn't want me, someone who just didn't care, unlike my mom who somewhat did. It was only DNA we shared. And there's not a speck of hope. There's a large amount of hope. It's just that we're too blind to see it. And we're too hypnotized with our electronics. We're too hypnotized with looking at a screen and believing everything someone says to us. Everything they see on social media, they think that's okay. And they think like, they see older people do all these things. Everyone that's supposed to be role models do um, posting things on Facebook about like all the negativity and everything. They, they watch that and you know, when I was middle school, I didn't have a Facebook. I didn't have Snapchat or Twitter, or Instagram, where all these bad examples are set for younger kids. I think that the adults should know what their kids' social media is like, what they're doing on social media. How looking at a screen can ruin your life. How looking at a screen can make you think different of somebody. How looking at a screen can inflict pain in your heart as well as in your mind. How looking at a screen can really just hurt you, in particular, just really hurt you. My parents are alcohol and drug free, so we live in an alcohol and drug free home and they both have jobs and they both go to work and make money and take care of us, basically. And I notice a lot around here, people are like kind of poor. No food, barely you, some people, I know, I know a friend, he, he has no flooring in his house. He has no running water, so he has to go outside to use the bathroom. And it's, he tells me it's very cold out there, and it's like here. He has to do that every day, and he has to get a hose to go to his, like, his grandpa's house, and he, that's how he gets water to go inside his house. Because there's like four families in one house, and it's crammed, and some of the houses are breaking down. They don't have heat, um, the water don't work, and like, when you, they need a place to sleep, but you can just have blankets and pillows on the floor and it can get cold in the winter for them, especially with babies and young children. Most people just sell like sell wood and stuff. I understand that they need money and all that, but me growing up without, without like heat at night and like my uncle, he used to come around a lot when he bring wood, but not all the time. Like, used to just make me happy whenever it's warm at night. Just sleep better. Used to stay up late to keep the fire going, but 
there's one thing I could change. If it was up to me, I would bring more businesses to the reservation to um, help raise the quality of life here. I used to go around, I go around my uncle a lot still today, cutting wood and like, getting loads of wood. I got a lot of, got a lot of grandmas that have wood stoves and stuff and they're not physically, physically capable of going out and getting it themselves. So I'm just thankful to still have them here. So I try to do a try and give them wood and stuff. So like they can live longer, stay warm at night. It's like, as younger, um, there's people that died during winters because it got too cold, they froze. And I don't want none of that to happen like any of our other elders. Because they, they know it's like in the old days, they experienced how it was. They, they know all our stories. They, they're the holders of our culture. They have all the stories to tell their ch grandchildren and stuff. And I realized that, so I, I try to give wood to them as much as I could if I go out and get some. There's a lot of things we can change on a reservation, but the one thing that I would like to change is alcoholism. It's really alcoholism. That's the one thing I would change on a reservation. If, if it wasn't for alcoholism, if it wasn't for alcohol, um, we would be contending with the majorities. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have all these stereotypes, these labels, uh, people being biased towards us. We would have all these different things and these, all these different myopic understandings. I always tell them that drinking's not good. All it does, it, it just makes you get into fights. Because there's so much young people that do it and it's just not right because it's not healthy for them. The downfall of that is it ruins families. It ruins races. It kind of ruins everything. It's not part of our um, culture. A long time ago, our ancestors didn't really do any of that, and I don't think we should be doing any of that. I think it's a disrespect. You know, drink responsibly. We're all adults. But, you know, Europeans had hundreds of years to get used to the effects of alcohol, whereas us, you know, we couldn't even get the flu we died because our immunities were different. All Indians do drugs and that's not really true because me, myself, and I know my family, my household family are drug and alcohol free and I really, it really irks me when people say all Native Americans are drunks. Cause my hands are cold Alone Where I found my own I'm walking Into the unknown Finally I could see beyond my eyes Playing with fire Cause my hands are cold Alone where I found my own. I'm walking into the unknown. Finally, I could see beyond my eyes. The dysfunction is from losing our identity culturally. The Lakota Way was taken away by the 
non, are the Christians, are the non-Indian. You know, they came here, they took our lifestyle away, they implemented theirs. I come from a bad, wrong, evil society. And I must forget all that, forget this language, forget my culture, and become a brown white man. That's what I was taught, be a good American, good citizen, uh, and I'll be rewarded yeah, by God at some point. That's all BS, but that's what I was taught, and that's what every one of us children at that time are taught. I no longer believe in man-made law or man-made justice, because uh, if we look at what happened to our people, there's no justice in that. Uh, because we were supposed to be devil worshippers, they don't want to talk about spirituality. And that's the thing that we couldn't understand, why my, the God that I believe in is evil. He was known as the devil as well. Well, that's not who I believed in. We believed in the first grandfather or the creator who is good and who does good. And he treats people and he, uh, he treats people well. It's pretty much what the, what the Christian belief system is, uh, is that's what we learn. Except that what churches and the government had, had taught us as young people that we were from an evil society. Now what do you do when you experience something traumatic? You find a way to cope with it. How do you cope with it? Well, at that time, alcohol was introduced to us. That kind of numbs the pain. And I think that's a, anyone might agree with that. Kind of numbs the pain. Now what other kind of things happen with alcohol? Lots of bad stuff can happen when you're drunk. I spoke Lakota as a kindergarten, so a white teacher broke a ruler on my head. Uh, that's that little one, uh, Kyle Day School. So from that time on, as a five or six year old who had a stick for so long, uh, broken on his head, I begin to resent what, what the white people are doing to me. Well, instead of machine guns, it's bottles. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, the genocide has continued. It, it's a continued genocide. It's just smarter genocide. Instead of bullets and bombs, it's sugar and alcohol. There's this car full of white boys that went by and kept saying white power, white power, and so I got scared, and so my cousins put me in the middle. And that car just turned around and kept saying white power, kept going back and forth. Because not only because of the color of your skin, but because they, didn't, they don't want you here. You should have been dead years ago. Your people shouldn't even exist anymore. I thought we got rid of you people. Even our history, it, racism began with my ancestors and the whole Seven Calvary and all the other, whenever first, whenever Columbus first came to the United States. Now how do we get the strength to, to go on from, from those traumatic events? There's, there's boys that I coach on my team that sometimes can't come to practice because they're watching their siblings at home because mom and dad were drinking all night. Or mom was drinking all night and mom's passed out and now there's just you know, them to take care of their siblings. So this is the type of stuff, and it didn't start from, from five years ago. It started 200 years ago. Ultimately, people want to forget about us, you know? Um, they want to forget their shame. Because if you do delve deeply into Native American history, you realize that the United States government was backhanded pirates. And, you know, the way that trauma occurs, trauma has a spirit. So what happened to my grandmas and grandpas when they were killed and they were being chased around and being slaughtered? Uh, and then eventually they were put on reservations and not allowed to practice our ceremonies. Alcohol and drugs is a medicator for past trauma and past hurt, and it's become generational now. But until we stop and connect, that's the only way we're gonna heal. Otherwise, that cycle of trauma and hurt continues.
we have different ceremonies that deal with trauma and um, what we call PTSD today. But that spirit of that trauma through these ceremonies is wiped off of us. When we experience trauma, it like layers on us, a spiritual energy. And it's layered and layered. And, and now it's about 200 years of layers on me because my grandmas and my grandpas weren't able to um, hold those ceremonies and wipe it off. So it's getting passed down and passed down and passed down. And they call it intergenerational trauma now. The day after I killed myself, I cried. I ran to the morgue and tried talking some sense into that girl, trying to tell her to wake up. She wouldn't. The day before I killed myself, I fell in love with life. The minute before I killed myself, I couldn't do it. Why does it feel like no one cares about her or no one loves her or anything? Her bright sunny days turned into dark stormy nights. She always asked herself, why do I get picked on? Why am I the one that has to go through the worst? Why this, why that? There's so many suicides on the reservation that it's, it's not even funny. There was a suicide, a mass suicide in January to March last year. And one of my friends, Alani Martin, passed away in that. She was the first one to commit suicide. And it was painful. I saw a lot of my friends hit that extreme rock bottom and they didn't know what to do after those mass suicides happened. And Me, honestly, I don't want no one to feel like that because it's really sad and it's hurtful. And sometimes I blame myself for it. Like, I could have been there for that person more, or could have done more to stop them do it. And me and my family were really affected by, um, affected by when my cousin committed suicide. But after doing all that, she finally found herself after crying, screaming. She talked to the one person that was always there for her. She felt better after that. Until this day, after six long years of fighting battles, she's still here. She's still standing strong, showing and proving everyone wrong. Thank her for never leaving. Thank her for still believing in faith, because this young woman you may ask of is me. I'm still here. There's a reason that the kids today think that they have to kill themselves, and it's because they don't think that they receive the love that is, should be granted to them. Because if you're gonna bring somebody into this world, like the least you can do is stay there and help them through the early stages. People here who could have taken their experiences and their challenges and turned it into something good for themselves. And I really wish that we could learn from our mistakes. It's not cool, man. You need to love yourself. I mean, how far are you? How, I feel like all these problems that a lot of these kids have will go away if they learn to love themselves. I know what it's like to lose somebody to suicide. And, and I just want people to know that that's, that's not, that's not, it's not okay. And it, that shouldn't be an option. Sometimes the adults don't understand, they expect us to come out and talk to us. Like some people like me, it's easy to us because we're comfortable with it. But there's some kids out there that use cutting alcohol and drugs as their way of escape. I know because I did it too. But they just need to understand that it's the life that they're stuck in that makes them want to leave. 
the suicide is a high, high epidemic because of the sexual abuse, the drug abuse, the physical abuse, and the emotional abuse that's thrown around out here. Namichik Unaha Wotchekile Koshkalaka with Koshkalaka Kantaha Wokie Unichilapi Yunka Wokah Nire Naha Wonspe Henako Wichak Opie Ampetu Ampetu Wan El Oganamaji Um Enna Uncte Enna Unctishni Yukta Yunkant Hunkashila He Het Havachi at the Yuhabi Kitchupia, Ho Hetel, Daya Akemanikte, Naha Chahena Yuha, Dona Dona Trechapi, Maka Kanlil, Uncoyam Yunkahena, Trunkashila, Wa Makabitak Upia, Ho Hetel, Daya Echarapi Naha, Dakuku Washtesh de Hena, Woechunk Dacha, Hena Wichak Tunkapia, Ho Hetetuya. The prayers for all the youth, and in fact, I was just gonna, you know, for our youth, and here it came to the world. I don't know how that happened. So it's all the youth in the world so that they can have the knowledge and to wipe out any thoughts of leaving before their time because they have something good to offer. Um, they still have a life ahead of them and that people would need them. So anyway, to wipe out, to wipe out the bad thoughts and the thoughts of leaving us ahead of time and then to give them the understanding and the strength to carry on and do what it is that they have to do because there's so many possibilities and there's no like limitations or boundaries as to what is out there and what we can do. Um, but I think that belief and hope is one of the most in, like important and necessary things to have. With um, the student council, we are, we are doing a couple of programs where, um, where we're aiming to help the community around us and one of the programs that we plan on doing, we're still in the process of it, is um, we plan to provide and sponsor more outlets for kids to um, express themselves and um, when kids express themselves they feel better and when you feel better then you're more happy. <laughs> it's called There is Hope, and it is basically uh, just um, trying to prevent suicide in as many, as many ways as we can. What motivates me is that, you know, I, when I leave here, when I, I'm graduating this year, and when I leave, I want to be able to say, you know, that was me that put that vending machine there. Me and my student council, we did that. We worked hard for that. And what really, really motivates me is, you know, the fact that I'll make a change, is that I could have that under my belt. Like, it may be hard, and it may be... I always think of things as, it's hard right now, but if you get it done, then it's easy. We're trying to become that leader again, to show that we have leaders again, to show that there's leadership in inflicting in our lives and that we're gaining a lot of leadership characteristics to help our people. I put on a big basketball tournament for all the youth to come together and um, be here and hang out and have fun, um, eat, because a lot of, around here there isn't that many young kids that get to eat a meal every night, so we fed. And not only was it, was it a tournament, we also had like booths around the gym with like information about suicide or who to talk to and all that and we also had people with experiences from suicide so we had parents that lost children to suicide here talking to the participants of the tournament when i look at my generation i see a lot of hope in them i see a lot of people that have every characteristic to excel to greatness and to achieve what they want to achieve yeah there's a lot of people that probably 
can't find the strength to make them achieve what they want to achieve, but it's there, it's within them. All they need is a little push, a little nudge. And it turned out to be a really big success because all I seen was smiles and smiles and smiles and that's what I really enjoyed and that's what we need is more positive. Personally, I found a lot of my strength from my roots and from my ancestors and from, you know, the, the very blood that runs through my veins, you know, and that's what inspires me and it gives me hope because I know that as an indigenous person, there, you know, Every year, our, every, like with every generation, we're losing our ways and we're losing our our traditions and our teachings. And so that gives me hope and it, it gives me a spark within me to continue to fight for like what we have and what my ancestors have fought for. I want my children to go back into their traditional ways. Wa'ushila, and that's caring and compassion for one another. And, but if we look at the values, each one of the values is a, that's what our ancestors gave us. That was the, to me, the treasure that they gave us. If we practice those values, it's, it's a way to live. It's a way to live life and, and how to treat each other. There's many stories, like why the people live as they do, why the animals, who they are, what kind of spirit they have, and why they're here for and even the fish have their own stories. The birds have their own stories. The eagle is the most, the paramount of, of all the flying creatures. Uh, he, the eagle communicates to the first creator, the first grandfather, because he's, he can fly the highest and go into the heaven to talk to him. He said, take care of the grandchildren and the children. And he said he was going to come back as an eagle. He said, one day, he said, I'll come back as an eagle and you'll, you'll always see me. So when I see an eagle, I know it's him. Our creation stories. Those are real important. So it gives those kids a, a base of where they come from. So we could keep our tradition alive and bring back our Lakota language. That's the biggest thing and problem that's going on in our culture right now. I am I'm part of a very cultural family, um, a very traditional family. One of the one of the few families that know the Lakota language. So growing up into that family, it's just it's just. I guess it's just um, constructed into my mind and my body and my soul. That's how our, our, our language is composed, is, is syllable by syllable. Every one of them has direct meaning, but it's always tied into something organic and something that is alive, like a human being or an animal or a flower or, you know, whatever has life. God, the first grandfather, which is the creator, or God gave life to whatever that is. A really cool motto, it goes Wanahielo. It means right now, in this moment. And um, it's a really cool motto because we should uh, do the best we can in this moment. And if we do that, then we'll put ourselves in a better position in the future. Our saying, Hokahe, is a good day to die. Would you fuck with somebody who, that's your saying, it is a good day to die? And I live by Blihichiapo, which means take courage. Take courage and just, just it just means take courage. Blihichiapo, take courage. It's the, it's the center of everything. And without courage, you won't be able to do much. And another one I live by is Nake Nula Wa'u. And that means you don't know how long you're going to live. You, life's unpedictable. You don't know what's going to happen. It's a, it's a very, very good warrior term. The language is what makes us who we are. And so if you forget this language, or if you stop speaking this language, or if you don't believe in this language, <clears throat> then you have just moved away from being a Lakota. You could be a full blood, four fourth Indian like me, but if I don't believe in those seven laws, I'm just a brown white man, you know.
The culture brings strength and when it, when we say the culture it's not a religion it never was it's a way of life the drumming, the singing, the prayers. Prayer is a daily, a daily thing. They help you through, like if you're sick, if you're feeling sad, if you're, like if you need someone to talk to, then you can like pray about it and then just, they, they help you a lot no matter what, whatever, whatever obstacle you have, like if you, the traditions will help you no matter what. Even if you think they don't, they, they will, it just takes time. Because of those deep-rooted spiritual connections that keep us alive, that's really what it's about. Because without prayer, I wouldn't be alive. You know, white man would say, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, and for us, it's I'll, I'll see it when I believe it. And um, there's, we have like ceremonies and um, like these traditions where a lot of it is involved in being in complete darkness. To me it's really important because it helps me find ways I could, I guess, vent. When you're going through your hard times and you know, like feeling sad and everything, prayer is one of our biggest um, go-tos, I guess. And it really helps me a lot, especially going in sweats. So Inipi is a, the sweat lodge ceremony, and it's um, it's a it's where we go into like this little lodge, and there's rocks um, in the altar, like in the middle, um, and we go in and like they pour water on the rocks, and um, then like that's called it's like a sweat bath basically, and like it's just a lot of like singing and praying. You know, it got beat out of the elders, and. It wasn't practiced. Sundance has only came back around the last 30 years, 40 years, and that's not a long time. I've been sun dancing for 10 years now. And for, for me, it's very hard because I go days, four days without drinking or eating anything. And whenever someone's sick in my family, I just go out there and I dance. And it's the hardest thing ever. And during sun dances, there's like a lot of spirits that come around and that bother, that bother us sometimes. It's a really good experience just being around like other family, other people that all follow the tradition and stuff. Like being active with your culture, everybody's cultural <clears throat> at sun dance. And I, that's what I like most about it. It humbled me. And you asked God, the creator, Ask to give the parents or whoever's sick in your family strength again. You know, our son dance is held at the end of June, battle a little big horn when shit goes down, it's a battle. It ain't no peaceful, oh, I love you, creator. It's battle against sickness, against, it's when we took out Custer and Custer comes back every year. And the scariness, that evilness, that demon shit, that cancer, the stuff that pisses you off and you can't do nothing about it, but it's there and you got to battle it. Without the healing I received from our ceremonies for um, PTSD that I've experienced in Afghanistan, um, I probably wouldn't be here today. I'd probably be in prison, I'd be dead. Whenever I come out of the ceremony, I feel refreshed and just good because it just like gives a lot of energy to you and it's positive energy. And it just like takes away all the badness from you. Oh, it's so cool to see even here in the high school, I see all these little girls. I think so many of them need to go through the ceremony and you know, all just to bring that little girl out of them because they're 
going. They're still a little girl and trying to make adult decisions, you know. And so if we can put that back in there for them, then their decision-making skills would be better, you know. You think about it, we're, as Lakota people, we're survivors and we've been surviving for you know, thousands of years, but, it, you know, today we're fighting different battles than our ancestors did. Like, <clears throat> with our cluster of suicides, it was like hopelessness, hopelessness, hopelessness. Now it's like they're finding it within themselves rather than uh, depending on the outside. Don't, don't be down, you know, keep your head up. Don't let, don't let, envi don't let your environment bring you down unless you allow it to, you know, just stay with a good mindset and just live life, you know, even though it's hard, because life is hard. I see a lot of change happening from the inside of our students. Like a lot of them are pursuing um, college a lot more. They're, um, I just see it, uh, a move back towards um, culture. When we speak about being a warrior, we all, all of us are warriors. It's in our DNA and we can tap into that. And if we, if we can find that within ourselves, we can bring back the warriors that, that we once were. To me, being a Lakota warrior is not only providing for your family, but providing for your community, for your people, for your tribe, for the surroundings. For, and in this modernized world, being a Lakota warrior isn't just sticking up for your own tribe anymore. It's sticking up for every minority. Because the only way we, can, we minorities can stick together is if we all watch each other, so we can contend with the majorities around. So being a Lakota warrior is a lot more than just protecting your own people, a lot more than just protecting your own skin color. Being a Lakota warrior now is protecting who you call family, who you want to call family. Remember ourselves, put ourselves back together. That's the only way that we can uh, save ourselves. They are warriors. They'll be warriors for God. You know, to sacrifice, like to lay down your life for something that you believe in, which is what our ancestors did. And, and that's, you know, that, that itself is something beautiful to sacrifice yourself for, you know, the bigger picture. It's a lot of sacrifices in our way of life. And for some sacrifices, or with every sacrifice, a lot of great things also happen. So it's, it's not you wanting to believe in that way of life, it's that way of life wanting to believe in you. I really like, I love helping people. <laughs> and I love making people happy. So yeah, I want to help people. It's called Medakia Oyasi. That means we're all related. And that's what being Lakota warrior is, is protecting everyone and anything, all living things. The Mokoche, the earth, the the wamakashka, the animals, protecting any living thing. 
that's what being a Lakota warrior is. The Pte Oyate, as we say, the Pte Oyate are the Buffalo people. We call ourselves the Buffalo people because of, you know, um, I think everybody who knows about us knows that we lived off the Buffalo. They were everything to us. They were our food, they were our shelter, they were our tools, they were our hunting weapons, they were our um, everything. Because it's who we are and because our ancestors did it a long time ago and it's it mainly just, it's just who we are. They are us, we are them. And some of the elders say that the only reason why uh, the Washichu didn't wipe us out, totally kill us whenever we were at war, it was because the buffalo stepped in between us and them. Now what happened to the buffalo? They were almost wiped out, almost wiped out. Now, You know, you see, you see what I mean? These, you know, these, these tears, these are the, this is the relationship we have with them. We are them, they are us. Our relatives were almost killed. They saved us. They'll be back though, we'll be back. We'll be strong again someday. I just want things to get better. That's all. That's all I want, man. I am only one leaf upon the tree of life that my Lakota people represent, and amongst me are hundreds and thousands of more waiting to be heard. I'm a green avocado boy and I'm hunting someone I winded through the badlands just yesterday I'm batting at the hills of the 7th Cavalry They don't have a clue what I'm hoping to do Scalp that damn general and that's my point I was just a kid Trying to kill that devil For all the things that he did I'll be damned If I quit before I see him dead I'll be the man to Turn that brown hair red I followed the soldiers Out into the plains I watched him at the campfire
after he was already dead. General George Custer is no longer alive. I'm a green-eyed Lakota boy, it's a good day to die.